you guys sound fantastic. I'm going to make you start doing more a cappella services. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is from our epistle reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is our text, dear friends, sisters, and brothers in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always. Our, uh, that's the theme of today, by the way. You see, uh, we have the nice banners in the back, uh, hope, peace, joy, love. And uh, we see joy on the third banner there. Uh, in, the, in the old traditional one-year lectionary, uh, this Sunday is known, the Sundays get names uh, from, the, um, from the intro it, and this Sunday is historically known as Gaudete Sunday, which means rejoice. And uh, that's why we have the, the pink candle, by the way, because um, traditionally, you know, originally Advent was kind of like, it was kind of like Lent for Christmas, right? And it was this kind of time of, of um, a, a time of, of repentance and, and a bit of self-denial. And, and the idea was that you, you know, on, on this particular Sunday, you got to kind of like lighten up a bit, right? And you could, you could celebrate uh, a little bit more. And it was an anticipation of, of the joy to come at Christmas. Um, needless to say, we, we live in uh, how should we say, a, less, a less ascetic and penitential society uh, than the one in which this Sunday was named. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if a lack of rejoicing uh, is, at least outwardly, that a lack of rejoicing is our, our general problem these days. Uh, the problem may be that, that we're done with it, like we've, we've had too much, right? Too many office parties, uh, too, too, too many obligations, too much shopping, right? That, that maybe we're just kind of overwhelmed by all the celebration already. And yet, St. Paul in our reading today tells us rejoice always. Rejoice always. Here's a question. When you you think about, I want you to think about, or maybe let's put ourselves in the minds of of non-Christians, right? When when people outside of the church think think of Christianity, when they think of Christians, do you you suspect, and obviously we're just guessing here a bit, but, but do you suspect that the first thing they think about is, Oh, those are the joyful people. I see a lot of head shaking. What adjective do you think they, they use? Church appropriate ones, that is. <laughs> Judgmental. Yeah. And I, I've I've heard that's one I've heard from people, right? Um judgmental. Boring. Bo- boring. Oh yeah. Dour. Dour. Superior, yeah. I think of uh, the Saturday Night Live's uh, church lady, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm glad I'm not the only one who <laughs> caught that reference. Um, yeah. And yet, right, I, I think that, that and, and it's unfortunate, I, I think, I mean, you know, some of that may be exaggeration, but, but there's probably, right, there's probably a bit of truth to, to each of those perceptions. Um, and, and to the extent that that's the case, we should repent, right? Uh, insofar as we ourselves have, have contributed to that, um, we should repent. Because here we are, called, we are called to joy. Rejoice always. And rejoicing is not, it's, it's not an optional Thing for Christians. I, I, what really struck me about this is that Paul, uh, Paul says, right, because <clears throat> for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is what God wants for your life. 
is joy. Which tells us something about the nature of God himself, right? That the God himself is not dour and, and judgmental and, and out to get you and to stop you from having any fun, right? What, what, and what may look like that sometimes is, is in fact, God's, God's desire to rescue us from all those, those false idols in which we seek false and misleading happiness so that he can call us back to where true and eternal joy is found, right? But what God wants for us is, is joy, and he wants, he wants it always, right? Rejoice, rejoice always. The truth is, is that's not always very easy, because how many of you feel joyful all the time? Yeah, nobody, right? So, um, and, and sometimes we may not feel very joyful at all, and maybe with good reason, because maybe we're going through real struggles in our lives, or we're facing real sorrow, or real loss, right? The, the, the difficulties of life, all those things that would lead us not to be joyful, right? Those things are real. And so, and Paul is not by any means denying that. In fact, if you look at this whole letter, uh, this is a letter that is written to a church that is facing persecution, Right? They're, they're facing hardship and persecution for the sake of Christ. And, and Paul talks about the, the hardship and persecution that he himself has faced. Right? So this is, this is someone who knows difficulty in life, and, and truthfully, a, kind of a level of difficulty that, that probably none of us has experienced. Speaking to a community of Christians who are, are facing uh, difficulties that, that none of us has experienced. And, and he's calling on them... Um, He's calling on them to rejoice. And he gives, he gives two further instructions there, which I think help us to rejoice. He says, pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. And I think what he's calling on them to do is, is to, seek, to seek the grace of God in prayer and in thanksgiving to see the grace of God in everyday life, right? And it's, it's in doing that, in seeking the grace of God, and then in, in recognizing that grace that we are enabled to, to rejoice. Uh, first of all, pray without ceasing. How are you guys doing at that? Right? That, that's, that's a struggle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, this is, what an amazing thing if, if to, to strive to go out about your day so that it is it is an ongoing, an ongoing conversation with God, right? Um, and that, that requires us to have an ongoing sense of, of the presence of God with us at each moment in, in our day. And a good way to do that, I, I think to start, I, I think all Christians, and this is something I struggle with myself, uh, and the, the busier things get and the more stressful things get, the easier it is to like let this slide, but but all of us should have we should have set times every day when we we spend time in God's Word and spend time in prayer, right? So that it becomes part of your your routine, uh, because those things a that way you allow God's Word to shape you, and then secondly you can bring all those things uh, that are on your heart to the Lord and and lay them at His feet. All those things that are that you're struggling with, those things that are too big for you, because they're not too big for him. And, and we believe that, that God hears prayer and that God answers prayer. Um, the other thing that prayer does, though, inevitably, is that, that prayer changes me, right? Um, I think Sula said something about that, too, right? That I, I pray not because it changes God, but, but because it changes me. And, and in praying and seeking the will of God, um, especially when we do that in the context of his word, it helps to conform us, uh, our, our desires and our wills, to his. And, and doing that on a regular basis, then, it, it creates a, a habit then that we can, we can move towards that, that continuous conversation with God in prayer uh, in, our, in our daily lives. And so I, something I, I encourage you, Advent is a great time. We're a little late in the season now, but, but it's, not, it's never too late, right, to, to spend um, some time every day in, in prayer, uh, which is why we give out uh, Advent devotionals. 
But whatever, whatever resource you use, whether, uh, whether it's something formal or just, just some quiet time, I, I encourage you to spend some time uh, every day in prayer. And then he says, give thanks in all circumstances. Uh, Christians are, are, are thanksgiving people. Uh, we are a thanksgiving people. The, uh, the old Greek term that is often used for Holy Communion is uh, the word Eucharist, Eucharistia. It means thanksgiving. That's, the, that's what he says right here. Um, and so we, every Sunday is a Thanksgiving dinner uh, in, in God's house. And that should shape us to be Thanksgiving people. And, and we do that by, by seeing in a new way, right? By, like Eliza said, to, to recognize in our lives, and if it, if it makes, takes writing down a list, then write down a list, but, but to recognize all, all the blessings that we have, right? Which begins with life itself. That, you know, our existence, every moment is upheld by the creative power of God, right? You, Life itself is, is grace all the way down, all the way down. And all the, the things that, that we have, uh, those good things that we have are, are gifts from God. But even more, much more than that, you have, you have the gift of Christ in whom your sins are forgiven, in whom you have an identity, an identity as a child of God in whom you have the, the promise that God is with you and God is for you, in whom you have the certain promise of, of eternal life that nothing can take away. And I think that's one of the other things that, that allows us to approach life with thankfulness and then ultimately with joy is that, that we already know the end of the story. See? Um, because that's, you know, ultimately what defines, you know, you're watching a movie or you're, you're reading a novel, you know, the kind of story it is, whether it's a, you know, whether it's a comedy or a tragedy or what have you, you know, is ultimately determined by how it ends. And a lot of people don't know, right? And, and they're very, very anxious about it. And what a gift that, that we know the end of the story, and the end of the story, and I'm sorry to spoil it for you, Jesus wins. Jesus wins, and he wins for you, which means that you win with him. So give thanks, and pray to him, and rejoice in him always. In Jesus' name, amen.